and uh, Second Muse, both EBBF members and organizations that support EBBF since a very long time. So I just want to say what Solcom says, it's reshape the world through meaningful work is the purpose of Sol.com. And from Second Muse, we bring communities together to build economies that benefit people and protect the planet. So I'm just very, very excited because of your vision to be here with you today and interview and understand uh, how we can really prepare for the future of work, how the future of work will really look like. And again, what is the, the, the role that values uh, more than ever uh, will uh, will take uh, for us. So, I mean, girls, why don't uh, want, don't you start and introduce yourself? Maybe you, Debbie, want to start. Yes. So I'm Debbie, and I work at Soul.com. And I um, uh, I think my colleague asked me to to be here because my working career looked a bit, uh, a bit strange. I think I started as a molecular biologists doing research in a laboratory and then I shifted to uh, to the arts to dance so I've done also uh, the dance academy and I've uh, taught dance and I, I did a lot of workshops and I did uh, performances and then I switched again to education and then I switched again to soul so I think that is why I'm here maybe <laughs> Because work is really something that I, I, I thought a lot about and I made some, uh, yeah, some unusual shifts, I think, in my working career. Um, and, and I would love to explore this because I think also for the next generation, it is so important that we can, can maybe redefine what work means and, and how you look at it. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Not an, uh, maybe an, uh, an unusual uh, journey for most of the people, but definitely not for this community. I think most of us have gone through such a, a major change throughout our career. That's why we're here today to explore how we can further make, uh, to make a further step ahead towards uh, that meaningful job that we are all looking for. What about you, Kerry? What has been your journey my, so far? Mine's, my, mine's not that unusual. <laughs> I have really been focusing in, so I'm one of two co-CEOs um, or one of two CEOs that leads Second Muse. We're a Baha'i-inspired company. We've been around about 14 years. Many people probably know about us by now. Um, and I, I've been part of UBBF before that when I was at Intel and led a lot of um, sustainability work. And so I feel like I've been really on the this path since my teenage years of using business as a force for good, right? The language has changed. The, you know, how we think about it has changed somewhat, but the general concepts are exactly the same. So um, I feel like <laughs> I, I could I could live, breathe, and talk about this for hours and hours and days and weeks, because that's what I do every day. <laughs> Fantastic. So you must have seen the, the, the way of working changing so many times throughout your career. Here. What, what do you think will be different now after all we have gone through uh, the past year and a half with this uh, pandemic that has forced us to to start working in a different way? Yeah, I, I think that in general there is a greater sense of humanity and for everyone, right? We're all human, and I think it's whether you know. I think we just all recognize that, and I also think we recognize that the world can be turned completely upside down, if you will, are completely changed in weeks, quite frankly. And so I think all of us have just kind of stepped back and said, okay, how do I want to be spending my life? Um, and I think, and how do I want to be engaging? And I think that's fair for companies and organizations as well as, you know, employees, if you will. So I think it's, I think it's just been a big awakening, but I also think it was years in the making too. I think if you just look at the trends for future for newer generations, millennials and, and those coming up behind millennials, you see that already happening, right? Pre-COVID, you see that the trends are people want, uh, people want to engage with purpose, right? There's, there's more to that. And I, I, I see that all the time. And I think there's a whole lot of intricacies in that, um, right? You can be purpose aligned and value aligned and realize that you actually don't like the job that you're in, right? Um, I, I, I feel like I could tell so many stories about people coming in and being deeply aligned to the purpose and the ambition of the company and realizing, I actually don't like doing this or I don't like doing that. So it's it's really pretty complex. Definitely. And do you see a difference between millennials and all the others? 
in terms of attitude and the way they approach work today? I think there's a different level of risk. So I feel like the risk tolerance is very different. So one of the things we're seeing is um, that younger people, and it's not just millennials, it's the ones coming out after the, that, that um, if they don't like something, they'll just quit. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Where are you headed? What are you doing? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, do you have debt? Do you have student debt? And they're like, yep. And I'm like, this is crazy to me. Like that level of the level of just risk and saying, I'm not going to do something I don't want to do is, is a bit mind boggling. And I've seen that, I've seen that quite a bit over the last, you know, eight or nine months. Um, and I think you combine that with like the, the mental health challenges um, that COVID has exacerbated. And all of a sudden we have younger people saying, I'm not going to do what I don't want to do, period. I don't care if I, you know, I, I don't fully understand how people are going to make it financially, honestly, because that is not my level of risk tolerance. <laughs> But anyway, that's that's where I see people's attitudes, not not in wanting to have purpose, not in wanting to have meaning. I feel like I see that across, you know, all the different generations that we work with. I think the core is the same. I think it's just that people's um, willingness to sacrifice, um, I guess, their happiness and contentment um, yeah. for different types okay. of work is very different. Thank you. Uh, and Debbie, are you experiencing the same? Uh, with your clients, do you see this big awakening that Scary is talking about and different way of approaching work from different generation? Yeah, of course, COVID made a lot of, uh, it was like, it was not the, the cause, but it was like the, the anlagging. Oh, I don't know the English word, but, uh, you know, the moment that, the ch that, the, that, it, that it became possible also to change. So I think this change was already like for a long time, you know, coming up. But this, this, uh, this moment of COVID actually was a, a, a huge opportunity for, for a lot of people, I think, to, to rethink, to rethink their, their lives and in that way also their work. And, and um, I think this, this purpose-driven movement was already there. But now uh, what uh, Kerry was, was sharing about risk-taking, I, I can see that as well that people are more inclined and especially younger people to, to really invest in themselves in a way and take the time to see like, what is it that I want to do, what I need to do? And it can be different reasons for that. And I think one is that they want to be um, true to themselves. There can be a reason like, um, this is, I'm not true to myself in this space. I, I'm searching for another, but it can also be a more, um, um, a more superficial layer maybe that yeah I, I just don't like it and I, I just you know want to find something I do like but I, I also see the the first category and I actually I find those people more interesting to uh, to have conversations with because there's really this driving force and I find it really fascinating how they are are willing to to just take time to uh, investigate yeah, and listening to you, I think about the, the definition of success must have changed in the past couple of years. Do, do you agree with that? And the, do you see a different uh, definition of success? Yeah, I think it's always difficult to see change really happening, but I see that more and more people are not so interested by success anymore. Like success in the way of status in the way of money um, security even like all the all those kinds of successes I, I i see a shift there and it goes more to um adding value um f feeling of use um um yeah uh, creating something new creating something that is not yet there like the whole entrepreneurial spirit i think that has grown enormously yeah yeah and that excites me actually because when i look at the world i think, think this is so much needed that we step out of yeah where we're at and step into yeah risk but also innovation and also really a rethinking of the things that we are doing right now. Yeah, definitely. So a different way to define success, Carrie, 
what do you think are the values that might prepare us best really to be successful in the future? You know, one of the things that we've talked, that we talked quite a bit about at our company and, you know, you can use different frameworks. They're, they're all, they all kind of mean, mean the same thing, but, you know, ikikaga, ikikaga, I can't speak this morning, but I think it's this as individuals, us learning about what is our own individual purpose and what is the type of environment that we are best going to, to thrive. And to, to me, that's, that's kind of one of the most important things for both individuals and employees coming into things and, you know, any of us as individuals. And I think as companies really understanding what is that, what is, you know, what can companies do to support individuals and in helping find that, but also making sure that this is a good fit um, for people. And so I, I feel like being clear on, so, so I think that's more of a framework of helping people understand things that kind of goes back to this notion, you know, I've had lots of, I, I mean, everyone in our company is dedicated to impact and has deep values. It doesn't mean that everyone shows up with the same values. Um, I think we've learned that time and time again, you can deeply believe in justice and in unity, but that might mean that you're incredibly conflict averse. And, you know, so I think the reality is, is people understanding themselves and what their purpose is in life is equally as important as organizations doing the same. And one of the things that we have is we have, we don't have a, we don't have values per se of what we call them, we have imperatives. And I'll share those, I'll share a blog that um, we recently shared. But the, the notion of imperatives is, this is a way that we expect all of our employees to show up and engage. And it's very different because values are one of these like deeply rooted things. And we've seen this, right? You can be deeply committed theoretically, to the elimination of all forms of prejudice. But that doesn't mean that you haven't gotten wrapped up in racism or, you know, you know, gender dynamics that are actually not supporting gender equality. We've seen this play out time and time and time again. Um, it happens, quite frankly, between Baha'is and non-Baha'is and different ge geographies all around the globe. We're all part of the systems that have been built. And so that's why for us values is important, but it's not really important in defining how we all engage in our work and with one another. So we, we use the framework of imperatives. It's a much more active um, way, but I think it helps people understand, is this for you or is this not for you? Um, Definitely, and how, how do you facilitate these conversations? Do you have a moment in your company where you pose and evaluate and, and converse and about those yeah. values? We, we do. So we, we incorporate the imperatives and I'll, I'm just going to keep saying imperatives, imperatives, imperatives here. I'll, I'm going to pop in a, yeah. a link here because it's not values, right? I think it's, it's something, it's something, you know, bring it up, um, bring it up several levels. We tried this. We tried like, how do you apply spiritual principles in a work environment? I mean, we've, we've spoken at EBBF conferences before on, on this. And I think what we've really learned is the more actionable we can get in terms of what we expect from people the better off the work environment's going to be. But yeah, we do talk about it. Um, Todd and I, we talk about it. We incorporate it into performance reviews. We incorporate it into feedback. It's kind of our actual, our mode of operating. Um, Todd and I meet with, so Todd Kosain is my co-CEO, and we meet with every single new hire that comes in the door. And we have a dialogue um, about imperatives and so that people understand them. And so, yeah, it's, we recognize people for um, how they're how they're you know really demonstrating them etc. So it, we try to make it more very very active. I mean every I think we said we're all none of us are gurus. We're all like acting in you know paths of humility. So the fact of the matter is, have we nailed it? Of course not. Will we ever? Probably not. <laughs> and what's going on in uh, Soul.com, Debbie? How do you how do you make those values or principle imperative more action? How, how do you really bring into practice the values uh, in your organization? Well, we practice it every day, actually. <laughs> like in every interaction, in every meeting, in every, you know, reflection, we, we really try to, yeah, to, to remember ourselves like, hey, we were, we were, we said that we want to search and cling to truth. What does it mean? Like very, very practical. And, um, and sometimes it gives very, very painful 
conversations also, because we are quite stubborn in um, holding fast to these values and, and wanting to bring them into practice. And that means we need to refine ourselves. And this refinement of ourselves, that is some, sometimes a very painful process because no one wants, you know, uh, to say like, oh, actually in this, you know, we were, we were searching for truth, but actually I was kind of promoting mine. You know, no one wants to say that, but sometimes you actually do that. So, and then to help each other um, get to that point, create this environment where someone can say, hey guys, I lost it here. Sorry, can we, can we rewind and, and maybe, you know, that I think that is what we're what we're really uh, trying to do, not only within Seoul but also with the organizations and the um, and the educational uh, institutions that we work with, and and that um, so our values are a bit more like almost attitudes, I would say. Like so, another one is to act with certitude, and that is not certitude like oh i know it all certitude but the certitude that whenever you cling to these values you will get to the point where we need to where you need to be and this certitude is also uh it's it's interesting how that can work through yeah uh all the interactions but also the methods that we that we use we are quite certain that we do not need to teach, for instance, but we can use the collective knowledge in order to learn together. And that is, so, so we really, yeah, we're really always quite aware of, of those values and in that way, creating the conditions for ourselves to grow and learn together with others. Have you seen the fact that we are all working in a virtual setup? Uh, right now, I guess both of you have experienced spiritual way of working, right? In the past 18 months. Has this impacted in any way this type of conversation, this type of sharing, evaluation um, of values and principle? Well, actually, we were quite surprised that it didn't. <laughs> so in the beginning, we were quite, you know, like taken back. But then we thought, well, let's, you know, there was no other. So there was no alternative at a certain moment like everything closed down and we wanted to continue so the only way was to you know to do it um, via this medium we're using now and uh, we, we just did it and we just noticed that actually you can have quite deep conversations uh, through also zoom and there's not there's not so much uh, difference actually um, if you if you can still you know create together this this openness and this environment of of trust but i also feel here that you know we're, we're here exploring together it's not like oh you know let's see when she make the wrong move or something no we're exploring together and if you have that in your zoom calls or in your interactions then that is the most important thing and I think we we just learned about that, and now we're quite hooked on uh, on internet, you know, uh, using the internet because it gives also a lot of opportunities we didn't have before. So um, yeah, for us it's now like a question, like like hmm, now that things are opening up, what are we going to do? Are we staying, you know, on the internet, let's say, and and in that way expanding our territory, or are are we going back to live session or, or do, we, do we do it blended or how does it look like? So this is still a question for us that is not answered yet. But I think uh, in, in six months we will know. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I have still so many questions that pops up in my mind. I, I want to let people asking you question. I'm just gonna ask one last out of my curiosity, um, more connected to um, work-life balance, uh, a healthy way of work. I've been hearing a lot of my friends uh, struggling with uh, working uh, amount of hours, right? They suddenly started working from home. 
uh, remotely and they had this pressure of uh, proving that they were working, ending up working way more many hours than, uh, uh, than before. Or other friends uh, struggling with the lack of uh, social interaction, human interaction. Uh, I think it has been good for many people, but has been a uh, mental, uh, particularly mental struggle for, for many others. Um, have you experienced something similar, Kerry, uh, in your companies? And how have you faced that? How have you used your imperative uh, to make sure that this new way of working can still be balanced from a health perspective? Yeah, totally. I think so. We've we've operated, you know, distributed virtual since our inception. So we've got look thirteen locate thirteen primary locations with employees around the world. Um, but, and we have we have employees everywhere, um, not everywhere, but globally. And so, so at a certain extent, we have seen it. I think the thing that I was going to put in, I was going to respond just more broadly, is that we have seen you can absolutely have authentic, deeply connected, engaged conversations virtually. One, it's a little bit harder if you've never met people, especially people, you know, just culturally. For some people, um, I think if you're all pretty, you know, in a monogamous type of culture, it's much easier. Um, but the thing that we've seen is we don't create as much social spaces and personal, you know, for, where you can have those personal conversations because we're so much more agenda driven, you know, okay, we're on this virtual meeting. So I think it's this, how do you create the social, the hangout space, right? Because when you're meeting with someone, you're going to grab coffee or, or tea or, hey, let's grab a bite to eat. Or, you know, it just seems like you're actually more productive in person and therefore you end up having more socializing time. So I think that that's something important for us. Yeah, we've seen people working way too much. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, that's just the reality. It's kind of like, and we've had, we've had to do interventions, um, especially with some of our younger single folks who, you know, they don't have family obligations and they don't have, you know, they are stuck literally in a single flat um, with no roommates, et cetera. And so we've actually you know, we've allowed people to move countries and to move locations. Um, and we've tried to help people actually stop working as much because the reality is, is um, people end up working way, way, way too much. And so I think it's something that we've been really, really conscious about of saying, okay, how do we, how do we help people? Um, especially if it's work that they love or they feel really, you know, compelled to do, or they feel like it's an expectation. So yeah, we've, I, I feel like we've run the gamut of everything that when people are like, oh, have you tried this and it didn't work? I'm like, yes, all the time. <laughs> so, you know, I hear, I, when Debbie says these things, I'm like, oh, this all sounds amazing. That, that wasn't our experience. We're like the poster child of, you know, where do things go backwards and, you know, south. So anyway, yeah, the short answer is we, we have to be very active about helping people balance their lives, um, you know, and say, when are you not available? we in our, in our company's history in you know, almost 14 years, I think we've had two cases where we felt like people just were not working. We never, we, we had the exact opposite problem. We always, pe we, we, we try to keep people from working too much. So we're much less on the, hey, are you slacking off to the, hey, I think you're actually working way too much. So I'm very intentional about like not sending, unless I'm sending it to my Asia team and it's very targeted to being very careful when I send out emails and when I communicate with people and there are times if I'm doing it, you know, in weird off hours, it's, I'm saying, hey, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I was doing something else earlier today. So I try to be very intentional, the signals that I send and, and I try to do the same for our other staff members, right? Um, we've all, I've also gotten much more um, visible about like my own work-life balance. Hey, I'm, you know, this week I'm in Arizona. Um, I'm taking my, my son to a summer camp and I'm not going to be working my normal hours, right? Because I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And you know, I, so I try to send pictures of me doing things and communicate to people. Like one of my priorities this week is balance um, so that people hear and understand that it's actually, you know, an expectation for people to, to take care of themselves. And we actually just call it wellness, right? Because I mean, what is, what is this balance business, <laughs> right? It's global companies all around the world. So it's like, how do we all take care of ourselves? How do we create wellness for ourselves? Thank you. Great, great example of leadership. Thank you for sharing. Anyone that has question, I just want you guys to have the possibility to ask some questions to Debbie and Carrie as well. Or share your own experience if you wish. I have a question for, for Carrie. 
Um, Because you mentioned, you know, gender balance is so important and and challenging sometimes to to, um, figure out dynamics. But I I find North America is a bit further ahead than Europe in general. Others can share their opinions if they disagree. (laughs) That's fine. But um, I'm just wondering from from your perspective on Second Muse, what, what have you found like difficult patterns or dynamics that are probably quite entrenched and how how like what kind of solutions and approaches have you have you found um, to the issue of of gender balance and and those sorts of issues I'd be very interested because I think this is also a key in terms of our societies transforming uh, the way we need to go is we have to <laughs> we have to move forward uh, on that topic and it's I mean women's issues have typically been framed in terms of balance work-life balance Balance, but this is something for everybody, of course, and everybody should be involved with, with their families, um, et cetera. So anyways, just any further thoughts and comments you have on that topic? Yeah, we've done a lot. I, we, we do a lot. Some of our big programs are specifically focused on gender equality. Um, and I, <clears throat> but it's a learning journey for everyone around the globe, right? We, we work with waste pickers all across um, Asia. Right, so some of the lowest, you know, in terms of power and privilege, some of the lowest um, women, and then we're, you know, we we work with kind of the, you know, the more executive as well as in like the tech industry, et cetera. So we we try to pull common themes together, and a lot of our work really comes into power and privilege and thinking about access and signaling. Um, it's so entrenched, just like racism, right? And I think that understanding it two years ago. We did an employee engagement survey, and the only thing that was kind of like this, whoa big eye-opener, um, this big eye-opener for, for me and for the, us is that um, the women scored across the board lower. Um, and it was kind of one of those, so we started digging into it and we started realizing that the dynamics between, you know, people thought that the dynamics between Todd and myself were, you know, they, they showed up gender. And I think at times they do. So we've spent the last year or so really digging into like gender dynamics. Um, we are about 67% women in the company. However, um, at the leadership team level, we're, we're way less than that. Um, I'm the only C-suite person. Um, I'm the only woman partner. And I think that we just learn, it's just so entrenched. Um, you know, a few years ago, I really tried to bust up. So, so I think this runs the gamut, I guess, is my point, right? It doesn't matter if you're trying to provide access to, to loans and credit in, for women, if you're trying to give them, you know, you know, a better work environment or if it's your own company. Um, we had a total bro culture going on, right? And think of these, think of these guys as guys that you may work with or in your communities that you engage with or your study circles or whatever they may be. And I'm like, guys, your bro culture is actually excluding me. And I'm cool with it because I because I'm pretty, pretty powerful and pretty dynamic and I'm kind of used to that. But at the end of the day, every time you're, you know, hey mate, hey, this and that and the other, you're excluding women. Right, we see this all over. And so I think one of the most powerful things for all of us is to deeply understand um, the nuances of where women don't have equal access and power and um, to anything, decision-making, being able to speak up and have a voice. Um, it's really rampant is what I would say. And so I think it's important to look at the big systemic levers that we have, you know, access to healthcare, access to childcare, um, you know, access to education. So I think there's some really fundamental things that we need to keep working on. And then I think in every single day, we can say, who is it that takes care of the majority of, of, of caring, right? Whether that's for the young or the elderly or the community, right? Who is it that regularly um, organizes community social events? Um, I just think it's so important to understand that. For years and years, I was on the always planned food for our company. And I'm like, this is I'm sorry, this is backwards. This is wrong, right? I actually run the company. Why am I the one that also cares for us? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's really widespread. And I would say I see it in every single place around the globe. I have never seen a single place that has actually nailed this well. Not a country, not a community, not a religious organization, not anything. I have not seen it done well, right? So I think it's a learning journey for all of us. Thank you, Carrie. Any other question? I had a question about, because I know both companies, Second Muse and uh, Soul.com are very strong on this, which is the relationship between the individual, the company in which you work, 
and the society that you serve. So there's, there's, a, there's a continuous interaction and I feel the world is mainly on the me, on the individual, and it's missing out on the opportunities of connecting the individual with the team, with the company, with the values and so forth, but also with the society that it's serving. I wonder how you built those bridges uh, and how you actually approach that connection and, and making that connection a fruitful one where everybody grows, going back to the individual recognizing that it's actually valuable to themselves as well to be serving this wider number of circles. Debbie, maybe as from Seoul? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is really like a, um, one of the principles we also work with that actually you can only develop yourself when you also serve the whole. Because in surfing the whole, you find, you know, you find yourself in, in places, in situations that you need to build more capacity. And then it's kind of like this upgoing uh, spiral. And, and yeah, I think how we do it is by actually by acting, you know, by doing a small thing and being able to reflect on it. And in that way, um, make ourselves aware, make the others aware uh, that, that this is, is a mechanism that is a very natural one, that, that when, you, when you act um, and you, you, uh, you serve, when you serve actually, that you always also gain yourself. And maybe even more, when you reflect on it, you realize like, hey, this is what, uh, what we're doing. And so it's not that we uh, directly, always directly uh, use these words, right? It's not that we say now, well, now you're gonna serve, you know, and then you're gonna build your capacity. This is not the language that we use, but actually it is the principle that we use. And uh, so we always ask like, okay, what, what do you see in your company? What is really needed? And can you think of something that you can do in answering this need? And so they can be the individual or they can be a group or they can be the management team. But by asking this question and letting them articulate, formulate an action uh, in that sense, then the spiral of learning kind of starts and, and um, uh, people themselves realize how, how that works. So it's actually by, by doing, yeah. So not the way. I don't know if you want me to respond, Daniel. Um, we needed we needed you like a couple of years ago to actually you articulated that so well. I'm <laughs> like, where where Daniel? We need more time with you. <laughs> um, I think I think being intentional. I agree, right? So with Debbie, like you have to actually just do it. But I think it's so it's a concept that most people that it's not normal in the business world, quite frankly, right? Um. I think one of the things that we see, we kind of play in between the hardcore business and government world and, and the nonprofit world. And lots of times in the nonprofit world, you almost have this notion of like complete service, right? To the point where if, if you're always serving everything else and you're not taking care of yourself, at some point that's going to feel awkward. And then you have, you know, what's perceived as more of the Western business world where it's all about the individual. And so it's this notion of we've actually really uncovered some unhealthy habits in the company um, at the leadership level when people kept thinking that they were coming from coming to our work with a frame of mind of we're only doing it in service of the company or in service of humanity. And it's like, yes, but we're all human <laughs> and we have human needs that need to be met. And if we're not meeting those needs, it's going to show up in weird and funky ways. And it's actually an undercurrent that's harder to find, right? Individualism is a much easier thing to spot. Like the, the, the weird ego in the, the level of service is actually a much harder thing to uncover in terms of culture and in the way it actually shows up in the work environment. So for us, one of the most important things is to really be intentional and explicit about it, telling people, look, we want to do what's best for the company, the individual, and the community, right? And only when you get those things, and it's not always, there's going to be times when you bend one, one way more than the other, right? More company, more very rarely individual, <laughs> but in our case, but, but, but there are, there have been times in the past when we did that, we were so supportive of people. Fantastic. You want to go work here and you want to do that. We'll support you. And it ruined projects and it was hard on relationships and it wasn't healthy. So 
I feel like in the past, we actually went way more towards supporting individual needs. So I think it's always this balance and communicating that to people helps people understand it. Thank you, fantastic. So we don't know actually how the future of work will really look like, but uh, we really don't. We got really inspired today. So thank you so much, Debbie and Carrie.